here with Linda Joy Myers. I have the pleasure of having her on the blog. We're going to talk about her new memoir, Song of the Plains, a memoir of family secrets and silence. Linda Joy Myers is president and founder of the National Association of Memoir Writers, where they offer free and membership programs to memoir writers. She is the author of two memoirs, the award-winning memoir, Don't Call Me Mother, and Song of the Plains as well as two books on the craft of writing, The Power of Memoir and Journey of Memoir. A writing coach, she teaches memoir workshops and co-leads courses through a program she co-founded titled Write Your Memoir in Six Months, which I have to say has got to be challenging. <laughs> a therapist for 38 years, Linda Joy speaks about family, the importance of legacies, memoir writing, and the power of writing the truth. She lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with her two cats and dozens of rose bushes. So welcome, Linda Joy. I'm really, really happy to have you today um, and to be able to talk with you about your new book, which I just, frankly, I'm such a fan. I think it's amazing. Oh, well, thank you. It's always great to hear that. <laughs> so much. Well, yeah. And, you know, um, just having completed writing my own second memoir, which is now in the editing phase, mm -hmm. uh, I had I, I kind of had that question about when did you know that you wanted to write a second memoir? <sighs> I tried not to want that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because uh, I thought, oh, gee, do I really, you know, want to go into all that again? I mean, it's such a personal and challenging process to write a memoir, as you know. Uh, but um, I'm trying to remember because I started a first version of what turned out to be this book two years ago. And I was um, thinking about the kind of the archaeological dig of our lives, you know, how mm -hmm. things spiral backward in a way when we're looking at um, our lives. And I was also thinking I would write about um, the 60s and 70s in the new memoir. So I was having a couple of layers of it, uh, uh, and I so I did eighty short stories. I did eighty five thousand words of a new version of the memoir, wow. and I didn't like it. I didn't feel that the voice was right. I didn't feel that I'd given the reader an experience uh, that. I wanted to give there were other little questions that I couldn't have told you what they were then because they were these semi-conscious um, hints that there was a story another layer of story I didn't tell mm -hmm. and so what I did when I realized this I needed to just stop and I did and I decided I wouldn't start writing again until I heard the voice in my head that I needed to use and that I wouldn't even think about it. I would just let it all go and see what happened, which took a little wow. Yeah. But I found it really, you know, interesting. Other, I used to be a musician, I used to be a painter, and there's all this wisdom in other arts as well as in writing about truly letting something go, truly um, being in silence you know, when you don't know what direction to go in. And so I took, I took that um, wisdom and I just went with it. And then I heard the voice that became the first chapter. And so I just hmm. wrote that and went, huh, well, huh, what am I doing? And then I realized the theme was the, the Great Plains and all I'll say more about that as you ask me questions, but but yeah. once I had that little new beginning, then I had I had a different book actually. It's interesting because I do remember talking to you a long time ago when you were starting to write about what was going to be the '60s, you know, '60s, '70s, or '50s through '70s, something mm -hmm. like that. And so I was a little surprised <laughs> when I saw you were coming out with the book, another memoir, Song of the Plains. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say that first chapter is, I mean, well, it really sets the tone for the entire book. And it's uh, that, that lyricism um, that is present throughout, really. Uh, and I mentioned it in my review of your book that um, I, I have personally struggled with a sense of place because I moved, have moved a lot in my mm -hmm. life. So I don't have that sense of grounding that mm -hmm. I get when I read 
your words. Oh. So for a person like me, it actually gives me a, um, a way of feeling or of understanding that sense of place. Mm-hmm. So it was a really, uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is anyone who has that sense of place is going to recognize it immediately. But for people like me who don't or who struggle with that, it actually provides it. So it's, Ooh. yeah, it, cool. it, it was pretty uh, amazing <laughs> for me. Um, let's mm-hmm. see here. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask you about your challenges when you encountered writing it. And I think that you've kind of gone over a little bit of that with trying to find your voice. And, and they're really, as I view it, there are several stories in your memoir. I mean, you've got mm-hmm. your, the kind of the carry through of your story of pain and loss in the relationship or, you know, lack of relationship with your mother and, uh, and your relationship with your grandmother. Then you also have the story of your research in your memoir of how you uncovered your family secrets and the drive to uncover those secrets. You have the family history itself quite a bit in there. And then, and then all of this is kind of embodied in the land. So uh, there's a lot there. And I wanted to ask you about your process a little bit. When did you start seriously researching, going into the family archives? Mm-hmm. And then, this is a complicated one, how did you ultimately decide to weave these different components of the story together? Okay. Well, um, the... Research began when I was eight years old when my great-grandmother told me the stories of her life in a feather bed in Iowa and she started telling me about the 19th century and I was just eight. She was 80 and she told me about things I had never heard of or imagined. Um, The way the neighbor women midwifed the babies, how hard the work was on the farm, the, the making bread, the wood cook stove in the summer, feeding the harvesters of 20, you know, three times a day, all, all kinds of amazing details. And then she told me, um, when, when she was telling me this, I was already living with my grandmother, her daughter, uh, and my mother had left me. And my great-grandmother started talking to me about my mother when she was a little girl. And I was like, oh, she knew my mother? And... This blew me away, and then that the, then of course then it was, of course it's obvious to us as adults. But you no, know, she's the mother of my grandmother, so my grandmother was her baby, and whoa, you know. So I got very curious then because I didn't live with my mother, and you know, family stories. You hear some of them, you don't hear others. You don't hear the ones that are secrets or right. have shame attached, and so, uh, but. Blanche, my great grandmother, she did say things like, "It's terrible that you and that your mother and your grandmother don't get along," and and it make it makes my heart hurt. And I wish they'd stop arguing and fighting with each other. And yeah, but she she didn't approve of it, but it also made her sad. And I that's a lot of story right there. You know, there's like a huge story there. <laughs> Right. And it also validated your own sense of that, the, that that fighting wasn't normal. I mean, you, you, you experienced a lot of pain and discomfort from it, but when you're growing up with it, you're not sure if that's how everybody behaves or not. And then, right. you know, to get that validation that, you know, yeah. no, this isn't normal. <laughs> it's not supposed to be that this way. extremely helpful. And, yeah. and that, um, that, that, because I was so cut off from my mother, my father, and until this visit in Iowa, this were my grandmother's mother and then her half sibling. I mm-hmm. didn't know. I didn't know about family. It turns out I'd met them when I was a little baby, but I didn't remember any of that. So I didn't know all these people existed or this whole history of their family on the land all around. So one of the things we would do for fun is we'd all get in the car and we drive around. Now you do a lot of driving around in the Midwest just to explore things, you know? And so we'd go to the cemeteries and walk around and say hello to people that were buried and these people knew them, you know, and then they go to the old houses that they had lived in and they would sit there. And so one early time, my great grandmother and grandmother, we drove to this house and it had, it was an old, house and it had a um it had a windmill next to it and it was just so evocative of another era and so my grandmother and mother uh, my grandmother and her mother were whispering to each other oh remember the peach 
uh, field was over there, the peach tree field, and oh, over there was this, and remember that, and they were whispering like they were in church. Huh. So this reverence to this place, and it turned out, I so then, then and then later years, I gathered, I don't know when and how much, you know, but I gradually gathered, this was the house that my great-grandmother got married in in 1894, Two months later, her husband died. My grandmother's father died. And my grandmother was born there. And it belonged to my great-grandmother's mother and her, and her husband. And so it was the family home. And that was a mile away from the Mississippi River. And so later, when I got more curious, I started researching, well, when did the family end up in Iowa? What was going on in Iowa when they ended up there? And so quite ca somewhat casually and somewhat through stories and somewhat through people going on through the photo books and telling me a few things. It was totally a patchwork for many years. But then about 40 years ago, I realized you could look up stuff in the courthouse and you could find out more information long before the internet. But that led to um, almost a 10 year um, practice of going to this tiny town library called Wapalo, Iowa. My mother was born there. Her father and his family were all from there for many years. And um, I had gone there as a little girl. I knew my grandfather until he died when I was 12. So I had good memories of this little, little tiny town. And I went to the library and I began to uh, research the newspaper archives there. And I was determined, as you know, um, I didn't know what happened to my mother as a baby. And no one could tell me. And I, I started this research before she died, but I realized she was a, a person who was so disconnected. She rejected me. She caused a fuss in the family. She couldn't get along with God even, you know. I'm <laughs> uh, it, she was a very problematic person, but hmm. what caused this? I mean, I'm a therapist too, you know, and I'm also curious, and I, I wanted to understand. So I thought, well, uh, Blanche had told me that that uh, my grandmother had left her when she was a baby. Well, I I imagine a babe in arms left behind all those years. Well, but well, what, who knows? Let me find out if I can find any clue to when she left. So I started doing the microfilm, and I learned that there's a social column, and you can whirl through the microfilm really fast. And once a week, there's this social column, and it'll tell you who was doing what, when, where, what they wore, and what conveyance they came and went in. I mean, it mm -hmm. was amazing. And there's our family names. I almost, I was like, yelp, oh, wow, you know. And so there's my mother's birth. Um, her grandfather announces it in the paper that he owns. And then I track their names once a year, an hour at a time for seven years. Took that long to get through all of it. Wow, I what a journey. So this is really, you've been truly researching this your entire life, and it all culminated for you, even though you only started to really write this book a couple of years ago, you've been writing this book your entire life. So that is what I realized in the silence mm -hmm. that I had, is I, I, I went, wait a minute, and so... Then what I did is I remembered, I mean, I knew but forgot that I'd been gathering books on the Great Plains. I'd been gathering quotes about the Great Plains. Mm -hmm. I'd been gathering, I'd been reading histories of the Great Plains for years and years and years. Not, I'm interested in those things, so that's why I read them. But that, um, that, Gosh, maybe this, I didn't have a title either. I mean, the title, I didn't write to the title. I mean, I got the title partway through, but it was sort of like I had this collection of zig jigsaw puzzle pieces inside of me, and I, and I hadn't put them into form. The final piece of the putting together was that I discovered what ended up being that sort of mystical, biblical-sounding voice that's in the mm -hmm. middle of the book. I wrote those pieces in 1992, three, four, somewhere in there. They came to me. This voice came to me and made me write this stuff down. <laughs> and I did. I mean, some other voice, it's about the Great Plains. It's about the history of the United States. It's about the history of, of the pioneers. It's bigger than our story, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. 
And so I wrote it down and there it was sitting, 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 sitting all these years. And so I opened it up and I began to read it and I'm like, wait, maybe this could be part of my book. Yeah. It was a very different voice. So I wasn't sure, but I showed it to my editor. I was sure she would say it was ridiculous. You know, she said, I love it. I love it. This belongs in your book. And then I went, Oh, okay. I see. I see what we've got here. Right. And well, and what that does for you is it takes your story out of being just a story about you. Mm-hmm. It's really a story about Americans, yes. really, you know, and, and, uh, and particularly people who settled in that area of the United States, mm-hmm. but it, it, it really broadens it out. And in fact, um, that's kind of the next thing I was going to ask you about. Look, look at my notes here. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, you know, there's so, this is so different than your first memoir, which was really written, you know, scene by scene. And, and this has a much more reflective tone overall. Uh, but you combine so many techniques. You've got that lyric prose about the land. You have this section, the midsection that you're talking about. You have uh, what I call found forms, where you replicate family records or newspaper articles that you found. And then you have this really interesting use of second person, where, uh, and I, I was kind of looking at it again uh, today and seeing that often that would be placed at the beginning of a chapter where you would talk about how a person would respond in certain situations and it would uh, be in the you form and how that all fit together. You know, normally, I mean, as an editor myself, if someone came to me and said, I'm thinking about doing this, Mm -hmm. I would go, well, I don't know. That sounds like it could be pretty fragmented, but it it wasn't at all. It, It really flowed. And in fact, you know, if you had, stayed with any one of those voices for the entire book, it probably wouldn't have worked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You, because you had that, that, that uh, lyrical poetic tone, which if you try to do a whole book with that, it can put people to sleep mm-hmm. because it's so kind of hypnotic, yeah. you know, that, that feeling of the land and the grasses and the wind and the song of the flames, you know, it's like, it's beautiful and I'm going to go have dreams right. now. <laughs> But, but it wasn't like that at all. So you wove that into the very fabric of your story. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we don't have a lot longer to go here, but I, I was interested in your decision-making process around that. Like, were you aware at the time or were you just writing and then kind of figuring out how it all fit together? Were you thinking, no, I want to do this this way? It began to flow. It just mm-hmm. began. Once I knew that the, because the first part of the book is a, somewhat shortened retelling of my early years and chi- my childhood years, but through the point of view of me now with the theme right. of the generations repeat. I began to watch it when I was young. And then as a therapist, I knew that was true. There's been new research done on the DNA of trauma, staying in mm-hmm. families through the generations. And I wanted to get that across at, an, at the angle that I came at for my own story. And I was seeding the fact that we were going to go into our family's past in part two of the book or the middle, the middle section. And that then I wanted to complete the arc of what happened. You know, how, how did I take in all this, all these things that happened in my life? And did I change the pattern of the generations, which was always a question. So I end with my daughter and me and my granddaughter in particular. Um, and, I, and also how I became a writer and using writing as healing in there. I wanted it to be a bit of testimony too, mm-hmm. you know, about the power of art. And, the, and I did actually, the, part of the story is me becoming an artist and using art as part of my autobiography first. And then I realized I needed words. And so I wanted to, and then my passion is that everyone is creative like this. You know, everyone can yes. do this. And I wanted people to feel inspired that they can do all of these arts and do whatever they want in, in a way, as a way of integrating all the different parts of who they are. And I do, by the way, think of this as a spiritual memoir in a way, because mm-hmm. it is not just my story i mean it's a story also of of people's hearts and survival and the planes and then that larger story and so everyone is just trying to find out where home is you know and where they belong and i i hope it's i 
I wanted it to be a universal story. Well, I, I think you succeeded really well. And um, congratulations. It's a wonderful memoir. And for those of you that are listening to this, if you haven't gotten it yet, you need to go pick it up and read it. You'll love it. <laughs> so is there anything else that you'd like to say about it um, while we're here at the end? Anything that comes to mind? Well, I, I have a feeling that I could also be speaking to the genealogical community, the people who are interested in writing family mm -hmm. histories and researching family history. And, um, and I just hope people f will feel encouraged because you can, I researched a lot of stuff and couldn't find a lot of things until I got to Ancestry.com and I'm not advertising them officially or anything, but truly I punched in a lot of things, but, and you've done some of this, right? You, you just end up uh, being on Ancestry.com for six hours, you know, <laughs> whoops, I forgot to eat dinner, you know, and uh, so, so that, that I, I think that people who are doing that are trying to, you know, um, explore who they are, their identity, and, and their purpose on earth, their purpose in, in life. And memoir is such a good way to do that. So is painting, so is photography. I mean, I think all of the arts um, are inviting us to, to, to be uniquely ourselves and give the world our vision mm -hmm. of that. And so I just want, I want everybody to do that, that, that are drawn to it, because I, there's so much satisfaction. And the society we live in tends not to be all that welcoming. And we have to do our art anyway. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. And um, I'm sure we'll continue talking. And I just look forward. I know this memoir will be a, a really great success. Well, thank you so much, Amber. I really appreciate your review and everything you said about it. You get the book and that's so thrilling. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, you have a good day and we'll talk again. Thank you. Bye.